Hi there. Welcome to Cook Local, Eat Local, the podcast where you can find inspiration, tips, and recipes for enjoying more local food and drink. I am David Crowley, your host. In today's episode, we'll be talking to Kamala about what to do with this week's vegetables and what wines to pair with our CSA veggies. First, let's check out what we have in this week's pickup. Okay, it is time to check out this week's CSA vegetables. First up, we don't even have to go into the bag because we have some nice red cherry tomatoes that didn't fit in the bag. And then boom, we are taking out some good looking small red leaf lettuce. Looks very delicate and tasty. And then next up, we have a couple yellow summer squash. Oh, and there's more where that came from. Yellow summer squash. We've got a lot of that. So we're going to need some ideas for yellow summer squash. Then we have a large beefsteak tomato, and I believe there's another one in here. And then boom, a big bag of green beans. I'm very excited. I'm going to make something tonight that Marwin suggested on a recent episode. So check out my feed for details on what I'm cooking based on that. And oh, we have a bag of tomatillos. Haven't seen these yet this year. So not something I cook with a lot. So definitely gonna be looking for ideas for tomatillos. There's that other tomato and boom, we have some fresh corn. Second corn of the season. Very excited about having that. And finally, da da da. There's another bag of fruit and we have a lot of peaches. It is apparently now peach season in Massachusetts. We got a lot of peaches to work with. So looking forward to that. Now let's talk with Kamala Mann, a home cook with a passion for local foods, products, and their stories. She loves and teaches culinary processes that encourage people to get into their kitchens, use ingredients they have, and embrace delicious imperfection. Hi, Cam. Welcome to Cook Local, Eat Local. Thanks for having me, David. It's so great to have you here. This is this is fun because I'll let our listeners know we we have been virtual colleagues in the food and wine blogging space for many years. So, I, and we occasionally get on live chats with winemakers and fun stuff like that. So, uh, you are a guest that I have a little bit of a relationship with, but I do realize that I'm going to get to learn more of your backstory, I think, uh, than I would have gleaned from our different wine and food pairing chats that we've had. So I, what I want to know to start out, I know you are a cre- very creative cook and very good at coming up with food and wine pairings, but I don't know sort of where that all comes from. Have you you know, if you've been a kind of a lifelong foodie or if that was something you picked up somewhere along the way. So tell me, how did you become such a passionate and avid cook? Is it, Let's hear some of the story. Yeah. So I think that it goes back to, well, I know it goes back to when I lived and worked in Rome, in Italy. So I went to Rome after I graduated from college and I ended up with a job where I was cooking for a family. That wasn't the primary reason that I was there. I went actually as an au pair, but she found out that I liked to cook. And so she had her cook teach me processes. And that entailed me going to the markets with her, meeting farmers, looking at vegetables, and then she would teach me what to do with a Mm. particular thing. And then um, the family that I worked for ended up firing their cook and hiring me to cook for them. So I ended up cooking for the family for the year that I was there. But what that meant was that I was able to forge these really strong relationships with the farmers. And because refrigeration is very expensive in Italy, people go to the market every day. And so every day I would go and I would talk to the farmers and I would see new to me produce. And it just really sparked this love of food and innovation and I think that's what I've carried forward into my life. You know, oh, that's great. Well, Italy is certainly a great place to fuel a passion for food, definitely. Are there any veggies over there that you would see in those markets that are less common? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So Example? one is, um, oh gosh, now I'm drawing a blank. It's related to the artichoke. Okay. And in English, it's called a cardoon. But it's oh, okay. in Italian, it's a cardi, and it kind of looks like 
celery on steroids. I mean, they're like two feet long and really thick and fleshy and a little bit hairy like the artichoke. Huh. Wow. Um, but you can't eat it raw, so you have to kind of strip it down, um, take off the ribs, and then usually Italians will blanch that and then okay. serve it in a cream sauce. It's delicious, oh, but you don't see it very often. And then yeah. another thing I noticed was um, greens. So they have mm -hmm. lots of different greens that we don't have here. Oh, okay. Um, Scarola is one, and I don't even know what that would be. I mean, I would think it would <laughs> <laughs> equate to maybe an escarole. Yeah, but, that's what it sounds but, like it, but <laughs> yeah. But with that one, they kind of just rinse and dry, saute with a little bit of garlic and raisin, and then drizzle olive oil. Mm. Yum. Of course, yeah. Olive oil, <laughs> olive oil and garlic. Yeah, will make a, almost any veggie taste good. Well, that is great. Now, you kind of answered part of what I was going to ask. So it definitely seems like getting into cooking and the whole connecting to local food seemed like that was hand in hand for you. I don't want to, I'm kind of guessing you're in Italy. Is that also where you got into the wine pairing or was that also a later addition? I mean, yes and no. I want to say wine was probably the first alcohol that I tried in my college years. And I just uh -huh. kind of stuck with that. And then after when I lived in Italy, that definitely was our drink of choice. I was with a group of au pairs there and we called ourselves the Red Wine Gang. And <laughs> Every Sunday we would get together. That was the day off that we all had. And we would meet at the train station, each with our own bottle of wine, hop on a train and do a day trip. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, so, okay. So now just to flesh out this wine pairing thing a little bit, because as I alluded to, and, and when we were chatting, that is a piece that I haven't talked a lot about yet on the podcast, but I did want this episode to, in addition to helping brainstorm you know, what I should do with what I just picked up at the CSA yesterday, also to sort of introduce the listeners to some ideas for food and wine pairing with local food and produce. So um, we want to be talking about that. So where did you, I mean, that sounds like you are just, that doesn't sound like a sophisticated food and wine pairing per se, those uh, outings with the bottle of wine in Italy. So when did you start getting into really having the, you know, matching up, you know, wines with what you're cooking? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I would probably say uh, definitely it blossomed when I was, you know, an adult and married and living where I do now, which is the central coast of California. And it sort of dovetailed with me meeting farmers and food producers and sort of naturally I met local winemakers mm -hmm. and as an adult then I had a little bit more expendable income and so <laughs> I was able to that learn helps. a little bit more absolutely about winemakers and wines and then joining the wine pairing groups I think you might have started the very first one wine pairing yes weekend. yes and have we been going for about a decade? Is that? Yeah, it's got to be close to that at least. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, we should check out the exact date because it's probably close to close to that. If not, I yeah. feel like it's a decade. But that wow. really stretches me as far as my comfort zone. And there's always something to learn because I feel like in those groups, we have a really nice mix of people that are more food centric, sort of the way mm -hmm. I was. And then yep. people who are, you know, um, more wine centric and more. Um, educated in that regard. And so I always right. walk away from those events with not just inspiration for food pairings, but just learning more about wine and grapes and winemakers. It's, it's yeah. really nice. Yeah, it's definitely been fun. And so I, I think what I'd like to do is kind of pepper uh, the, the wine pairing aspect of, of things throughout the rest of our conversation. But I do um, you know, I know people tune in in part to see, you know, what should I do with certain vegetables? And that's part of what I want to ask you about. So let's segue to, you know, the, some of the things I picked up yesterday. One of them, one of them, as I told you, was uh, tom tomatillos. So um, I know you have a recipe idea for that. And also I'd like to just, that's not something I work with a lot and others might be less familiar with it as well. So just some general tips on, on that vegetable as well as the recipe idea you have would be great to hear. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I know that this is just audio, so people can't see what <laughs> we're looking at with a tomatillo, but it, even though the word tomatillo means little tomato, it's not a tomato. Mm -hmm. So it, though I think people do also call it a husk tomato. It's related yep. to a gooseberry. And so it's oh, more akin huh. to um, if you had a tomato in like a husk, literally. <laughs> And so one of the things I found, well, if you're getting it in your CSA, then it's probably, you know, peak ripeness, because that's right. one of the things I love about the CSAs is whatever you're getting is perfectly ripe when you exactly. get it. But if you're growing it yourself or if you're looking at them in a market, you just want to make sure that the husks have cracked open. So, oh, okay. yeah, when the that's paper it, so. kind of splits open, then that's mm -hmm. it's ready to be eaten. Yeah. And so the recipe that I'll, I'll talk about in a second is one that's made with um, fresh tomatillos. So just mm -hmm. completely raw, you peel that husk off, give them a nice rinse because they do have a little bit of a sticky film to them, but just right. a little bit yep. of water that. and then dry it off. If you're not going to eat them immediately, you can store them in the fridge for probably two weeks is probably the longest that I've done it in a paper mm -hmm. bag that's open. So it has a little bit of um, air circulation. Okay. And so that'll be about two weeks if you need to leave them that long, or if you have a glut of them and you want to preserve <laughs> them, I just take that husk off, give them a rinse, lay them flat on a baking sheet, and then freeze yep. them till they're totally solid. And then oh, okay. those you can, you know, put in a Ziploc bag or however you want to store them and they'll keep in your freezer for six months or so. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm glad you, you, you answered one of the follow-up questions I had because like when I got it, you know, most of the produce was just out loose, but they had the tomatillos actually already in a paper bag. So I, my instinct oh, was right. I put them in the fridge that way. So, so I guess that that's the way they should stay. But, uh, so that's great. So tell us, tell us about what you're, what you're suggesting we make with that. Yeah. So when you sent me the list of what you were getting, I was instantly intrigued by the tomatillos, mainly because like you said, there's a pretty short season for them, especially where you are. And I think a lot of people are intimidated by them because they just look so alien. They're this green little <laughs> orb with a shell yeah. on it <laughs> or a husk. Right. Um, so I think, and I actually have some, and I picked up whole fish today. So I'm going to share with you a whole roasted fish recipe with a Yum. fresh tomatillo sauce. And oh, it's super simple. Another thing I love doing with the CSA veggies is I just want to highlight their freshness. So I try not to cook them a whole lot. Yeah, so this recipe... How many tomatillos did you get? Do you know roughly how it much they weigh? It wasn't a made? lot. I, I think I had like three or four, but they're bigger than I've used. Like when I've had them before, they've been like almost like just a little bigger than a cherry tomato, but these are bigger, like almost like the size of a re regular tomato. Like oh, a those are beef. big. Yeah. Those are big. I, okay. So yeah. I would probably weigh them. And then, mm -hmm. so the process I would do is if you have a pound of tomatillos, mm -hmm. you can just sort of quarter them. And then with a pound of tomatillos, I would do two whole bunches of herbs mm -hmm. and then maybe a half pound of any kind of pickle that you have. So mm -hmm. it can be, you know, dill pickles or whatever's in your fridge. Huh. If you want a little bit of heat, I would yep. add in some uh, pickled jalapenos. Oh, okay. Nice. And then just a little bit of the brine from the pickles and you blitz those all up in your blender or food processor mm -hmm. and that's it. Okay, so no cook, so it's a no cook sauce. Yeah, no nice. cook sauce, and it's gonna keep the tomatillos that beautiful bright green color. Because mm -hmm. if you cook them, then they might get a little bit muted, and the flavor changes a little bit. When okay. they're fresh and raw, they're kind of bright and tangy, and then as mm -hmm. you cook them, they mellow a little bit. So oh, I mean, okay. it, it's still a delicious sauce, but it just changes yep. it. Okay. And then how I plan to serve that is with um, a whole roasted fish that I, yeah. I picked up at the market today. Wow. And so I know, actually, I'm glad you mentioned the fish side too, because we're interested here. We've been, because we're talking about the CSA as our starting point, we talk about veggies a lot, but I do, especially when I have folks on that eat fish and or meat, you know, like to chat about that too. So you're getting local fish typically. Uh, and I think you mentioned you're in something analogous to a CSA for fish. I'd love to hear a little bit about yes. that. 
So I do belong to, it's just a CSF, so Community okay. Supported Fishery. Yep. It's a slightly different model than the CSA, where with the CSA, as you know, um, you subscribe to it for the whole season or at least several months. So the farmers have that influx of income early. And then yep. the consumers, we just get the produce throughout the season. The CFF, CSF is a little bit different. And then you just subscribe to it. They send out what it is they have as a share. And mm -hmm. then you either say yes or no for the week. Oh, okay. Nice. And you can get, um, like what I was listening to about the Harvey share that you have where you can yep. specify. Mm -hmm. So this yep. one is either you buy it for a share for two people or four people, you know, that sort nice. of thing. Yep. Yeah. So I missed the cutoff for this week's CSF because I just wasn't paying attention. And when I tried to order it this morning, it said it was closed. <laughs> so yeah. I ran down to our, our Fisherman's Wharf and I just picked up, you know, three whole rockfish. Rockfish. Okay. Yeah. They're common out there, aren't Very they? Very common. Yes. I came across, so they have here, in addition to the CSA, there are a couple other like local food share things that we have. And... I was for a while doing an option of getting fish along with some local meat. And um, I think rockfish came in at once. I definitely had to look it up because it's not as common here in New England as it, so it sounds like more on the West Coast. But OK, that sounds good. So that sounds like a delicious preparation. I, I am someone who likes I didn't grow up eating fish. So I always like when I do have it to have some kind of flavor, you know, not just the straight fish, but, you know, some sauce to spruce up the flavor. So this sounds like this would be up my alley. But it then to round things out, of course, a wine pairing. Do you have a wine pairing you'd suggest with? So rockfish is, if that's if I more of a white fish. If um, It is, yeah. It's yeah. a white, firm, fleshed fish. I picked up a uh, black rockfish and a uh, vermilion rockfish, which okay. really the flesh isn't any different. It's just sort of the way that they look on the outside. Yep. And so, you know, you and I had talked a little bit about relationships with winemakers. Mm -hmm. So when I found out that I was going to be doing this conversation with you and what I wanted to make, I reached out to a local winery, um, yep. Seabold Cellars. Uh, they okay. are based in Marina, which is kind of one city up around the Monterey Bay from me. Yeah. And I just said, okay, tell me what I should pair with this and tell me why. Nice. <laughs> and so we chatted a little bit. They picked a wine and I ran up to the winery today and I picked it up before our chat. But they chose, um, so it's a white French grape. And I'm going to ask you because yeah. I pronounce it a certain way and they pronounce it a different way. Oh, okay. So I have always pronounced it alligot. Yeah, that's a what I would say too. Okay. Yeah. And then on their wine label and also talking to the winemaker, he says alligote. So the difference oh, okay. of the E, the French E with the accent grave, right. which is the way I would have said it, or accent yeah. gu, which is the way he says it. Oh, okay. So yep. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that grape other than it's typically like it's an and a second white grape you get from Burgundy typically, right? But, right, it's usually um, fact, a blend. I think the first time I had it, I thought, you know, I saw, oh, there's a white Burgundy, and I thought, why does it taste doesn't taste right? And I realized, oh, it's actually not made from Chardonnay. Well, that would be why. So, uh, but I, but I know in California, I think I always like that trying things that you maybe have had the old world version and seeing how it changes when you have it grown in California soil and sun. So that sounds, that sounds great. So that, that sounds like a tasty pairing. Um, yeah. So this winemaker uh, really does like the French grapes and he, mm -hmm. like you're saying, he does kind of put a California spin on it. All of his vineyards that he sources from are organic and sustainably farmed, which I love kind of goes yeah. hand in hand with the way I view food. And then yeah. this is a single varietal. So I feel like I'm really going to get that um, characteristics of the alligot with the fish. Nice. And when nice. I asked why they picked this one, they said that unlike some of their other white wines that are a little bit more hefty, this mm -hmm. one would be kind of fresh and bright. And they thought that would go really okay. nicely with a tomatillo sauce. Yeah, that sounds perfect. And, and 
seeing as we promised to talk a little bit more about wine pairing in this, like that's an example, I think, of where you try, kind of doing matching flavors, which is one strategy is like fresh and bright. The wine, fresh and bright, is just the same way you describe the tomatillo sauce. And that's um, that can be a good pairing strategy. Other times, you know, spicy food, you might be looking more for a contrasting flavor, but that sounds like a good a good strategy. And I think if you if you test it for us before we publish this, we'll, we'll be able to put in the show notes. Perhaps you can give me a little of the info on how it, how it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. We're actually having it for dinner tonight. So I will let Perfect. you know how it goes. All right. Well, I look forward to hearing hearing about it. So by the time we go live with this episode, uh, we'll we'll have that insight. So be sure to, if you go to cooklocaleatlocal.com, you can find the show notes and we'll have We'll have the 411 on the pairing that we suggested. But we should move on to some, you had some other ideas for other things I picked up in my bag yesterday. In fact, I'm seeing I had summer squash, fresh corn. This is this is the height of corn season in New England and tomato season as well, quintessential summer vegetables. And I know in California, you probably have summer vegetables for like most of the year, but here we we cherish it because it is fleeting uh, the, the season for corn and tomatoes in particular. So it sounds like you have an idea for combining some of those in a nice summery dish. I do. When I saw your list, so I believe you had a, a yellow summer squash is what you mm -hmm. got in your yes. share. And yes. then I saw fresh corn and the cherry tomatoes. And like yes. I said, I really like to highlight the sort of freshness of the CSA vegetables. So I, again, I try not to do a whole lot to them. So mm -hmm. what I did was I took some summer squash and I just cut really thick slices, gave them a quick sear, put them on a platter and then I mixed in a mixing bowl just corn that I cut off that cob, uh, yep. diced cherry tomatoes, a little bit of salt and olive oil and a squeeze of lemon juice. And this kind nice. of stirred that up like a salad and put that on top of the seared squash. And it was just a really nice summery side dish. Ooh, that sounds good. And now the corn, is that cooked? Do you cook it all or just? No, nope, it's just, oh, I mean, okay. like it's nice. with with it being so fresh, I just yep. eat it raw. If it was a little bit older, like maybe it had been in your fridge for a couple of days, you might just want to give it a quick sear on a grill pan. Yep. And that, that will bring the sweetness of the corn back up to the surface and then just slice it off and, and use it in this fresh salad. Yeah, that sounds very good. Now, were you thinking of that as a side for the fish dish or something separate or either way or so I would think of it at, yeah, you could absolutely have it as a side dish for the fish, but you know, if, if you're doing sort of, my husband tries to eat less meat during the week mm -hmm. and we eat yep. proteins Friday, Saturday, Sunday meats that way. Yep. Um, that is a really good sort of vegetarian dish. And if you okay. eat yeah. cheese, you can toss in some mm -hmm. cotija cheese or feta in with that corn salad. And that would make yep. it to me like a, a bigger entree. Right. Now, if you were doing that, I don't know if you had thoughts on that one as far as a wine that you might go if you were serving that or if you were pairing to that dish or or because I'm guessing it might go with that same same wine and that might be what we had in mind. But yeah, that's uh, it. That's what I had in mind. And I had mentioned all the dishes I was making. They definitely said the aligote. But like what you were saying that kind of intrigued me was either go bright and fresh and bright and fresh together or do bright and fresh and something a little bit different. And so mm -hmm. as you said that, I was actually thinking that the squash and corn salad might pair really nicely with um, a more oaky Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Yes, especially if you're doing a, uh, like, I could see it definitely, the, as you described that alley goat, um, it could complement, they could complement each other nicely, just like the main course, but on its own, especially if you added that, some of that cheese to make it that substantial substantial main course uh chardonnay definitely and i know you're in a great area for i, I love monterey seems to produce some very good chardonnay uh, as well yeah they definitely do and and i do sort of walk that line between not liking them too buttery and oaky right so it, it's kind of a hit and miss for me if depending on the year yeah okay yeah but i feel like overall and this is a gross generalization and maybe it's <laughs> knowing what to look for, but I feel like 
in recent, you know, past five years or so, I feel like California Chardonnays have been toned down a little to be a little more subtle than I feel like there was a time when I tried to stay away from this, especially for food pairing, because, you know, if if something ha- has so much oak and butter going on, and what, you know, it's, it's not particularly food friendly, but when they're when it's more nuanced, I feel like it's friendlier companion to more dishes. But uh, I think you're right. I feel like, yeah, in the early 2000s, definitely the 90s, California Chardonnays were much more butter bombs. Yeah. And now you're right. They have gotten a little bit more subtle and, and nuanced. That's a great way to describe them. Yeah. Speaking of, do you have any other thoughts you know, there are a couple of things we've been talking about concepts of wine pairing, but specifically you have the advantage of you're in a great region for wine. So local wine to you uh, means they're close by. But as I was thinking about like, oh, wineries I might want to feature on this podcast, I was thinking they're a very small short list that are <laughs> truly like geographically local. But I also feel like, I feel like there's also sort of a I know some values that we're trying to support when we're having these conversations and you seem to touch upon that. You know, you mentioned the winery that you got the wine for your dinner tonight is, you know, they're local, but they also have that organic. They're like, they feel like farmers and, 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 and and so forth, not a big conglomerate, but I don't know if you have thoughts that, you know, you think of wines that you feel like are align well with the value of people that are trying to eat you know, local food, sustainable food. Any, any thoughts on that one? I think that you're right. I'm definitely spoiled in that regard. I have <laughs> just a plethora of wineries within 10 miles, much less, you know, 100 miles. I've heard yeah. the definition of local for local foods anyway as being up to 100 miles. I find that yes. a little bit far, but... <laughs> Again, that's because of where I am. I can go to right. a farm that's, you know, two miles from me. But, yep. you know, I think with anything, it just takes a little bit of thoughtfulness to kind of get to know the winemakers and really see what aligns with your belief system. And mm-hmm. again, you're right. I, I'm very lucky. I can I can search out and connect with a lot of people who share, you know, my interest in natural, organic, sustainable farming. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that might actually be a good segue to mention, we've alluded to a couple times the Wine Pairing Weekend group that you and I are in, and you are hosting our next event. And Maybe you can tell us about that because I think for folks who are listening and say, oh, yeah, I'd like to learn more about that. I think a lot of members of our group are highlighting wines that sort of, you know, align with some of those things you're talking about. So why don't you give us a little bit of a preview of what's what's going on in the event you're hosting and how people can connect with it? Sure. So the genesis of this group was obviously you, David, but (laughs) uh, once a month we get together with a group of food and wine writers and we have a theme. And this theme that I'm hosting is sort of a CSA challenge. So I, I challenge the writers to look at either what they're getting in a CSA box of their own or just a local farmer's market or really whatever's in season that they're getting yeah. and come up with a wine pairing that goes with those veggies. And mm-hmm. I think it, it's a, it is a challenge in the sense that first, not everybody puts vegetables in the center of the plate. Right. So I think that when you have vegetables as the showcase, then the wine is thought of a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's meat in the center of the plate, it's like, okay, well, if it's chicken, I can do white wine or if it's meat, I can do red wine. But with vegetables, I think vegetables are sort of a a canvas that you can add a lot of flavors and textures Mm -hmm. to it that would affect the wine that you choose. So I'm really excited to see what the writers come up with for this. Mm -hmm. And like you said, this is going live our CSA Challenge Wine Pairing Weekend is for August. Oh, I should know the date on this. <laughs> Let me look at my calendar. It's next yeah. Saturday, August right. the 13th. Yes. So if somebody is listening to this August 13th, it will be live. So that's great. So if somebody's yes. getting this podcast on the first day that that we go live, this is going live two days before that. So it's either coming soon or already out there on the web, uh, this event. 
Great. Yeah, and all of the posts go live between sort of Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th. And if you are happening to listen to this ahead of that and you want to jump in, we do a live Twitter chat on that Saturday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time. And then you just yep. follow the hashtag, hashtag wine PW for wine yep. pairing weekend. And then be sure to add that to anything that you tweet so we can see it and interact with you. That would be great. Yeah, great. So both that Twitter chat and then each of those articles that our colleagues uh, write would be great ways to to get more examples of wine and food pairings that sort of lean into the CSA theme. So, so this is definitely going to be a lot of fun. Um, can you also, I guess, before we wrap, you know, you, you've... I think listeners can see you've got a lot of creativity and wisdom in the kitchen. How, you know, tell us a little bit more about where, you know, what you, what you do on the web and, and being a resource for people interested in, in, in cooking and being adventurous and, and where we can find you to learn more. Yeah, thanks for asking, David. So people have asked me, you know, what is it exactly that you do? Or how do you characterize <laughs> what it is that you are? And for a long time, I didn't really know how to answer that. I'd sort of flounder and say, oh, I do a lot of different things. But a friend sort of succinctly labeled me once as an epicure. And I thought about that for a while. And I realized that really is that embodies how I feel is somebody who's passionate about food mm -hmm. and loves to eat, loves to drink. And so I do have my hands in a lot of different arenas and lots of different channels, but I love connecting with people. I want to inspire people to get into their kitchens and cook for themselves and yeah. embrace this delicious imperfection. And I don't necessarily <laughs> share recipes. I do share recipes, obviously, but I look at what I do as more of sharing a process. So yeah. if I'm sharing something like this process with the tomatillo sauce, you can yeah. do that process with regular tomatoes and you'll come up with mm -hmm. a very different tasting sauce, but the process is exactly the same. Right, and, right. And so to connect with people, if people want to connect with me, I think the easiest way would be to join my community in any way if whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or if you want to just email me, um, I do have a landing page that you can just see all of those links. So it's tinyurl.com forward slash culinary cam. And then um, I'd love to connect with whoever has questions about veggies or wine pairings or anything, anything like that. Excellent. Well, that that is definitely something I would encourage you to check out that link. And we will link to it in our show notes if you're driving. So we uh, look forward to look forward to seeing more about all these great wine pairings with the CSA veggies. So thank you for hosting that. And thank you for joining the Cook Local, Eat Local chat today. Thanks for inviting me, David. That was a lot of fun. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Cook Local, Eat Local. To get the show notes with links for recipes and resources we covered today, go to cooklocaleatlocal.com to get the podcast landing page. And please be sure to subscribe to Cook Local, Eat Local wherever you get your podcasts. Make it a great day with some tasty local food on your plate.